The future of learning actually is even more important today than it was when I first did the hole in the wall experiment in 99. At that time, I was only trying to see if children can learn to use a computer, which of course we know they can. Now everybody knows, even two-year-olds can use an iPad. But what has changed during that time is that answers to anything is available to all of us instantly. We uh, have got so used to it that we don't think about it. That whenever you have a question, your first reaction is to pull out your phone, isn't it? But that wasn't the case even 10 years ago. So what does it mean? It means we are learning things continuously. People sometimes say, oh, are we becoming more stupid? Of course not. We are becoming far more in intelligent because learning is not restricted to that one lecture. It is continuous throughout life. And you read something on the phone, your brain remembers what it's reading. So it raises a very peculiar question. Should, you, should a child spend 12 years of his or her life learning things and then be prepared for life? But this is from a century where learning was available only in very selective places, like schools and libraries. In this age, that's not there anymore. So can I now build a case to say, let's not waste those 12 years? So what do we do then? Well. Instead of having a one-way transmission between the teacher and the learner, why not simply ask the learners to learn things? Because while it's true that you can find the answers to anything on your, on, off the internet, but you need to know how to ask the right question. So I think if the teachers switch their roles to asking the right big questions, that can drive the whole of schooling. Well, the hole in the wall experiment was done in 1999, a long time ago. And uh, the idea was that children who don't have access to computers, because computers were expensive those days, you know, two, two three months salary. So it was irritating that why should only rich people's children have access and not the others? Well, the answer is money. So then I thought, well, what prevents me from taking 300 children and giving them one computer? At least it's better than nothing. I didn't expect any great results from it. But to my surprise, if you give 300 children one computer and leave them alone for long enough, all 300 learn how to use it. This I didn't realize. And the hole in the wall showed that over and over again. So once we established the fact that a shared resource is in some way more powerful than individual resources, it's a, I think for the West, this is a difficult concept to, to, to answer. But I think we are beginning to see, and I think there are many people now in the West who are talking about this, to say that sharing ha has a value which is different. So if we establish that with the hole in the wall, then what happens next? What else can the children do with shared resources? So that part of the experiment I did in England, and I was able to show that children, groups of children, given one internet connection, shared, can learn almost anything by themselves. That was called a self-organized learning environment or a soul, S-O-L-E. It works like a beehive or an anthill. So if you take an ant's nest, those big ones that you can see in Africa, for example, and if I were to say that, look, that looks like a cathedral, so who designed the foundation? But the answer is nobody did. So does it mean that the ants know civil engineering? No, they don't. But as a group, they can apply the basic principles of civil engineering. We don't quite understand how, but I know that children can be made to behave that way, and it's probably very good for them. Once you have the soul, then comes the question of what if there is no one to ask the questions? You know, like you said, somebody has to know that this is the right question. So I created what's called the granny cloud. These are basically retired people, but actually people who have an interest in children, who are willing to Skype with children one hour every week. That's all, which is not much time. And all that they do is they just say, hello, how are you children? And she may be talking to children thousands of miles away. Oh, so what are you doing today? Oh, we are doing this. Oh, is it raining outside? Yes, it's raining. Oh, where does the rain come from? And stop. 
this combination of a self-organized learning environment where children, you know, work like a beehive, uh, which is triggered by a question, and the question might come from the cloud, from a, a granny cloud. If you put it all together, we gave it a name, we called it the school in the cloud. It is so heavily dependent on the internet, as it should be. Because if all our children are going to grow up like ourselves, as users of the internet 24 by 7, what reason is there to pretend inside school that the internet doesn't exist? So put your phones away, put everything away, now come inside and listen to me. Why? So we have to let the internet in. They are going to live with the internet. We have a strange society today where we say the internet can be very dangerous for children, but we don't let it into school. We allow our children to muck around with the internet in the streets. Is that right? If it's dangerous, it's the first thing that should come into school so that they can understand its nature. So uh, what do we want out of schooling? We want happy, healthy and productive people. I, I think nobody is going to argue about that. You might argue about what productive means. And I will make a case to say productive no longer means how much you have memorized. Memory is not important. My memory is here. My memory is not, not, no longer does, has to reside only there. So memory's role is redefined. I will remember what I want to remember. What I don't want to remember, my phone will remind me. So if that is the kind of worker that you want, that's the kind of citizen that you want, happy, healthy, productive, what are the skills they should have? And I make a list of three. You could make a long list, but I, I prefer to make a list of three. Comprehension. Our world is complex. The ability to comprehend is important. And comprehend is a bigger word than understand. You know, if you see the, the difference. So reading is one way of comprehending. It's not the most important way anymore. Watching a YouTube video and comprehending its content is equally important. The second skill, communication. Not just interpersonal communication, but communication with machines, communications with, in offices, communication across continents, across cultures. All of it is possible for everyone, one of us today. So writing, particularly writing by hand, uh, it's a curiosity, it should be a hobby. Uh, who, who writes by hand anymore? So why spend all those years teaching children to write beautifully by hand? You know, I mean, they're not, they're not Phoenicians or Egyptians from 2,500 years ago. They're from now. They need to know how to communicate. Okay. Can you write an essay using Twitter? I think this is, that's a skill that we should learn. Okay. How, do you, how do you transmit emotion? How do you use video correctly? Because everybody can make videos now. All of this comes under communication. And lastly comes a more difficult subject, computing. I don't mean writing computer programs. I mean, that's okay. It's a nice thing to know. But computing in the sense of the word computing is the ability to solve a problem by any means. So, you, you know, you might say, I will compute the answer to this problem. Not necessarily that it's an arithmetic problem. It could be a human problem. What does compute the answer means? What's the easiest way to get to the right answer accurately? And my favorite example is a little girl who once said, I think the easiest way is to call my mom.